It's really great to be here today and share some thoughts. Uh, as you see, the title for this talk is going to be The New Non-Killing Paradigm, which implies there's an old paradigm, and we'll get to that in a second. But what I'd really like to do is focus in on the perspectives from different disciplines. So say with a little bit of tongue in cheek from anthropology to zoology. Um, so we're gonna consider different evidence and different perspectives, which really lean us to a new way of looking at uh, human nature, animal nature, and our non-killing potential, a new paradigm. So I'll start with a few overall propositions. First of all, if we think about how Western society overall, certainly in the United States in particular, um, we accept as part of human nature a large level of violence. We just take that for given, for, um, for granted. In the early 21st century United States, and, and perhaps more broadly around the world, it seems like these aggressive or bellicose views of humanity really prop up the militarism that we see worldwide. Um, it props up and supports a military industrial complex of arms trade, and dealing with conflicts internationally that involve aggression, as well as using aggression within states. So this is just seen by many people as the way things are. It's just acceptable, uh, even necessary, and in some cases desirable to deal with our conflicts in this way. However, there's strong evidentiary reasons, there's strong evidence to question the validity of such violent views of humans and society. So as an anthropologist, uh, we consider culture. And if you boil down this complicated cultural concept, um, there's three elements that really recur in a lot of different definitions of culture. It has to do with behavior that's learned, that's shared, and then transmitted. And, and in essence, that's really what we're talking about when we're thinking about views of human nature as well. What are our attitudes, values, and beliefs about human nature and other things in our culture that we learn as part of growing up and that are shared amongst people within that culture. And then of course they're transmitted to the next generations. So what I'm gonna think about here in this talk is how our view of ourselves and our modes of interacting with other people really are part of our cultural learning. Um, a new non-killing or non-violent paradigm can be then seen as a different cultural perspective on things, a different way of looking at things. And this is where this idea of a, a paradigm comes in. There are many interdisciplinary lines of evidence that are really pointing in the same direction. So I sort of use my finger. It's like a bunch of arrows all coming in the same direction and converging on a new way of looking at things, whether we're talking about anthropology, archeology, span a couple of A words, all the way down to zoology. And in between, or in addition, we might add in things like military science, um, peaceful societies, peace systems, and a whole variety of different types of observations from, from primate literature um, and so forth that, that do point to streams of evidence coming in the same direction towards a new paradigm, a new way of looking at things, which really is supporting a non-killing, um, non-violent view of humanity, much more so than the traditional paradigm that emphasizes how aggressive and warlike we supposedly are. So in terms of a, a challenge, how can we support culture change away from violence and war towards non-killing and non-violence? You see, that's an applied question. Well, let's phrase it in a different way. How can we support a new paradigm as an alternative to an old paradigm? How can we shift our cultural perspectives to think about things in a different way? And here's yet another way to look at the challenge. How can we help to define the default assumptions that promote human well being and survival, a positive and a negative piece? So, how can we really think about things differently to promote peace would be a, a shortened way to, to put it that way. Let's start with observations about the traditional or the old paradigm, just so it's clear to everybody watching what I'm talking about. And here's a friend. Um, who has passed away, unfortunately. Robert Sussman was a primatologist. And in a, a chapter he wrote for a book that I edited some while ago, he said, the claim that humans are by nature genetically programmed for war and that human males have a genetic propensity for violence is readily accepted. 
If one traces these theories into the history of modern biology, we can see the Hobbesian view has predominated. Hobbesian view is, of course, named after this philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, and uh, he tended to see humans as rather warlike. So that's, that's what Sussman is referring to there. Here we have um, a familiar face, and um, Sean Evans Penn has written, he's, he's edited, first of all, um, a book called Towards a Non-Killing Paradigm. And in the introductory chapter to this book, Schwann writes, paradigms determine which issues are subject to inquiry. What are the appropriate questions and what methodology must be applied to solve them? I see there's a typo in there that should be must be applied. Sorry about that. So here we have Schwann introducing this idea of uh, paradigms and of how they shape our thinking. So this is a very apropos quote to thinking about a new non-killing paradigm. Here's a, a, a colleague of ours, um, Les Sponsel. Uh, I, looks to me like he may be in Hawaii from the vegetation and the hammock and so forth. Um, he's, he's from Hawaii, taught many years at the University of Hawaii. Les Sponsel writes, the natural and social sciences may be on the verge of a paradigm shift. There's that P word again, a paradigm shift, to include nonviolence and peace, as well as violence and war as legitimate subjects for research. And again, this is a quotation from a chapter which Les Sponsel wrote for Shawana Evan Pym's um, book Towards a Non-Killing Paradigm. We are seeing a dramatic shift away from nature red in tooth and claw, to quote Alfred Tennyson's famous line, to recognize also the importance of prosociality social reciprocity, a sense of equity, and conflict resolution as reflected in nature read in truth and law. Had a little fun there with that one. So what we're going to do now for the really the remainder of this talk, uh, aside from some conclusions at the end, is consider these different lines of evidence from different subfields and different disciplines that are pointing in the same direction uh, in support of a non-killing, non-violent uh, way of looking at life, as opposed to a, a previous classic or traditional, whatever you want to call it, emphasis in at least Western civilization, which tends to emphasize how we are a nasty lot by nature, how there's always been violence and, and greed, and that's really defines us as a human species. All of that is being questioned independently in, in many cases, by findings, evidence from different disciplines. So this is gonna, it's gonna seem like a lot, um, and we're gonna cover a lot of ground, but I, I think you'll see how it all starts to connect. And we won't go into a lot of detail on everything. We will go into some detail on some of these topics and areas, but the overall idea is to go subdiscipline by discipline um, and, and look at how the new paradigm of non-killing is reflected in, in this new literature. So we'll consider mammalian heritage. That's really the zoology. Um, so from Z to A, uh, mammalian heritage and the primate heritage uh, in particular, we'll look at this concept of restraint and why that's important. Also another R word, reconciliation, cooperation, empathy, equity. And then we're gonna turn towards archeology span and take a quick look at um, some archeological studies that are in support of a non-killing, non-violence paradigm and go, go forward to consider peaceful societies, peace systems, military science, what that has to contribute to this debate. Um, homicide rates are also important, just to mention. And conflict resolution, it occurs in every single culture. So again, we'll, we'll touch on all of these topics uh, in different levels of depth. Let's jump in and get going. So our first one here is really to think about ourselves as mammals. And I know this is a, a shift in thinking for almost everybody. We don't wake up in the morning and say, oh gosh, I'm a mammal, um, but we are. And we share certain evolutionary tendencies and traits with, with this whole um, class of furry, in most cases, um, critters. Most intraspecific aggression in the mammalian world is non-lethal, most of it. Um, so that should give us something to think about as we view ourselves as mammals. Um, here's a quote from a primatologist, actually, Bernstein. And he says, the potential costs of fighting are such that natural selection has favored individuals that avoid taking risks 
when the cost of themselves is likely to exceed the benefits. So in other words, just to try to put that in more common language, um, aggression is dangerous. It entails certain costs. Um, there must be a good reason to engage in aggression in an evolutionary sense. There must be some sort of payoff or benefit. And that natural selection is actually the, the biological process that has over millennia, many millennia, um, acted in this way to produce a mammalian pattern where aggression is sometimes seen, but that it also, will argue shortly, is restrained. So mammalian aggression, therefore, rarely involves a total war of all-out fighting would be another way of putting this. Um, but instead, intraspecific aggression or conflicts are usually of a limited war type involving inefficient weapons or ritualized tactics that says, seldom cause serious injury to either contestant. Um, if you like this picture, it's not really a, a two-bodied zebra, it's just two zebras butt to butt. So um, I think we skipped one slide. Maybe we didn't. Um, so mammalian heritage for non-killing. There's been a, a recent study that came out just a few years ago um, where they looked at over 1,000 species of mammals. And they looked and saw how often a member of the species kills another member of the same species. There's variation in this. Some, many, in fact, uh, mammalian species just don't have any intraspecific or conspecific killing whatsoever. It's been determined you know, on these studies. If you look at the overall average, Gomez et al. found that one third of 1%, one third of 1%, so about one time in 300 deaths uh, is that death caused by a member of the same species. Now the order primates to which humans belong has a slightly higher average, uh, the, the primate order averaging to about 2% of the killings or one in 50 could be attributed, attributed to a member of the same species. So my point here is, and it's really Gomez's at all's point, is that killing within mammals is not really all that typical. It's a bit higher in primates, but not really that high either. Sussman, whose picture I showed you earlier, got together with another primatologist, Garber, and they looked at the data for 60 species of non-human primates across the different subcategories of primates from prosimians, monkeys, and apes. And, and they found, and pay attention to this, this definition or this list of, of terms, mild spats, displacements, simply one animal being there, moving the other one out, threats, stares, and fighting. Um, so in other words, there's contact behavior as well as non-contact behaviors listed in this definition. In any case, they looked at these 60 species and they found um, that these types of behaviors accounted for less than 1% of all interactions. On the average, adult apes engaged in only one act of agonism per month. So this whole um, cultural mythology we have of King Kong, the violent gorilla, um, the killer chimpanzees, and all of this stuff um, is greatly exaggerated, is one of the implications of Sussman and Garber's study. If you think of, of humans, we've sometimes been called the naked ape. Um, if we were to classify ourselves objectively, we really are an, an ape along with chimpanzees, um, orangutans, gorillas, uh, as the great apes and so forth. So this is a bit um, going against, uh, again, sort of a classic or traditional assumption that our, our fellow ape ancestors and our, our fellow living um, primates are very aggressive. Furthermore, let's look a little more deeply at the primates because they are our closest relatives. Here's a quote from um, an article I co-authored with Anishala. The ratio of non-contact to contact agonism paint a fairly consistent picture. Non-contact agonism prevails and actual wounding is very rare. So let's look at some data and you'll see what we're talking about. Here's different species of monkeys in this case. They're from different studies, and in all, each of these studies, the, con, the uh, researchers have put together the amount of non-contact, in other words, no physical contact, no danger there if there's no contact of being injured or, or killed, versus contact agonism. And you can look at the ratios, except with the exception of silverleaf monkeys at the end, there's a pattern where non-contact is uh, greatly outnumbering contact episodes. But let's look deeper at that one. 
That's an interesting pattern in and of itself. Non-contact agonism tends to prevail when there is some sort of um, uh, aggressiveness. Uh, number of bites, look at that. Rhesus between groups, zero bites. Uh, chakma baboon, zero bites. Chakma baboons within the group, a, a few more bites there, 20 bites. Um, and we're not talking <laughs> computer space here, we're talking <laughs> bites. Pattus monkeys, just two bites out of these, these different episodes uh, and so forth. But the, the picture gets even more convincing. Look at what just has come on the screen in yellow. Um, no one was actually wounded with these bites. So they were not what you, uh, if you're a primatologist, call canine bites, so those nice projecting primate canines that can work the flesh and cause a wound. They're actually incisor bites, little nips. That's my best imitation of an incisor bite, <clears throat> uh, which don't actually break the skin or, or cause harm. So this leads us now to our very next point of consideration, and that is restraint. This is really a, a much under-investigated and under-thought about topic restraint. You will read books and books on aggression, violence, war, conflict, and how it's all raging out of control. And nary a word is said in these types of studies about how actually there is a whole lot of restraint going on. Restraint at the level of the individual, restraint at the social level, restraint um, in various different ways as conflicts which could be lethal are restrained to become uh, expressed in non-lethal ways, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, just a wonderful topic for further research and consideration. But let me just share a few words what this means to a non-killing, non-violence paradigm. Really, much of the agonism uh, among animals involves no actual physical contact. We've just seen that with some of the data. Non-contact displays are very common and very safe. When physical contact does occur in the mammalian world, it often consists of ritualized aggression, wherein serious injuries and, and death are unlikely, such as the headbutting contests for which the ungulates are, are famous. And I'm sure you've all seen pictures of you know, deers uh, and other ungulates like that pushing their their horns or their antlers together. What you may not have seen is the interesting example of, of giraffes when they engage in a um, neck and, and head battering contest. Uh, the giraffes compete, they, they batter each other with their necks and their heads until one gives up. Now, when I first read this in the literature, I pictured here's one giraffe head and the other one, and sort of back and forth like this. But I happened to be channel surfing on TV one time, the nature show came up, and they showed two giraffes going at it much more violently and, and uh, you could hear the slapping sounds. Well, giraffe vertebras are huge. You can look at that neck and figure most of that is vertebra. Um, and their heads are nice and solid and they do have these little horns on top. They managed to do this without seriously injuring each other. Although to me as a, <laughs> a person watching this, it looked quite, quite remarkable and seemed pretty violent. But my point here is again, this is an example of the ritualized aggression. Giraffes do not try to kill each other. They just batter each other with their heads and necks, as strange as that sounds to us, um, until one of them gives up and leaves and the contest has been determined. So the key point here about restraint is the prevalence in mammals of displays instead of contact aggression and ritualized forms of fighting instead of what um, researchers have called total war. And this suggests an overall principle that restraint is a more successful evolutionary strategy than engaging in unbridled aggression. So I put that in yellow with a, with a real purpose. That's, that's really a key point as we think about non-killing and how it would have evolved that most of the time, most of us are non-killing individuals. It also has the implication that therefore, it would be uh, not as difficult as sometimes suppose to create a non-killing world, non-killing societies. Um, because if we're really leaned, uh, if we're mammals, which I think we are, and if we're primates, which I know we are, um, we would fit uh, the, the normal evolutionary pattern that has evolved across many species to not really um, engage in very much killing uh, per our, our species nature, per our evolutionary history. There is evidence that this restraint principle applies to human mammals also. 
So let's turn to human mammals for a, a second here. Um, here's again one of the, the many very interesting and useful books that Siobhan Evans Pym has edited or co edited. This one, um, Dan Christie and Evans Pym, Non Killing Psychology. So um, restraint operates in, in humans. That's part of our physiology and our psychology and our, our sociology. These cultures shown here, society and continent, are a group of what we call nomadic foraging societies, the type of society in which humans have lived most of their existence on the planet, um, living in this type of, of society. And on the right side, it says the restrained event. Basically, um, we took a look at the literature, and this is uh, Anna Jala and myself um, writing in 2013, and we looked how are these societies, the nomadic foragers, dealing with at least some of their conflicts? And we noticed that very similar, fitting the mammalian nature, very similar to many mammals, you see a restrained, ritualized type of um, conflict resolution going on, where yes, the people involved may be injured, but unlikely killed. So there's this limitation or this restraint. So among the Netzalik Eskimo, and Schwan Evans Pym has written, on them about song, song dueling as a restrained type of aggression, and also um, just very ritualistically taking turns to strike each other on the shoulder or the head until one person gives up. So again, this is so much less than one guy picking up a bow and arrow or a spear and stabbing the other person to death, and all of a sudden you've got a homicide and a death on your hands. No, it's, it's culturally ritualized. So you either try to compete your rival by singing uh, in a song duel, or you compete um, in this very structured way in front of the whole community to determine who's going to win this contest and who's not. Wrestling is a classic example of this, and you see it in many different cultures. Some have um, particular variations on this. There's a, a group not listed, but the uh, Mabuti uh, of Central Africa. Sometimes they would take a flaming log out of a fire and swing it at an opponent, the opponent would pick up a log and swing it at his opponent. They did this without ever making any physical contact. It looked very dramatic as two guys are battling it out, swinging flaming logs at each other, but nobody ever gets burned or even hit. So this is an example of restraint as well. Humans do it also is the main point here. So to take a little um, view at where we are and where we've been, um, on this list of various disciplines and types of evidence, we've looked at the first three. Consider the mammalian heritage, the primate heritage, and restraint as three clusters of things that go together. Um, again, supporting, I would argue, a non-killing, non-violent um, type of paradigm. Uh, so I should just say at this point, you notice I'm not arguing that aggression never occurs, that humans do not have a capacity for killing. Obviously, we do. Um, other animals sometimes engage in killing as well. Sometimes it's an accident um, or, or a tusk or something accidentally slips and cuts the other individual or something like this. It could be on purpose, such as the cases of infanticide, but these are not the main um, primary way that, that animals behave with each other. So this is really a paradigm shifting um, sense of evidence from biology. Let's go on in this vein and consider reconciliation, cooperation, empathy, and, and these other elements on this um, list of, of, of information or list of um, sub-disciplines. Franz de Waal, as you may have heard of, is a very eminent primatologist, and he's made various contributions to the field, but one of them is to really recognize how primates and other species reconcile. And this starts from the idea that animals, social animals in particular, need each other. They're just like humans. They rely on each other for, for different um, positive interactions, protection from, uh, from predators, for instance. So what Friends de Wall observed was when you have apes, monkeys, other social species, and there's been a, a conflict, they very often reconcile. Reconciliation varies per species, he says. But in most cases, it's effective in the restoration of the relationship, as reported in, for instance, macaque species, as well as gorillas, bonobos, golden monkeys, manga bees, capuchins, and so on. And this is really a, a key remarkable finding, which has uh, been very important. But beyond this, there's been a variety of new books, um, some by Wall, some by other writers like Mark Beckoff, uh, 
And here's again a, a book edited by Sussman along with Cloninger about the origins of altruism and, and cooperation, which all fit into a new way of looking at humans and a new way of interpreting the animal behavior and how it connects or reflects also in, in human beings. And this would be that uh, they acknowledge the pro-social nature of the majority of the social interaction in social species, all of the caring, sharing, tending, and befriending, also cooperating, empathy showing, and equity seeking that occurs. So let's just, so let's turn to archaeology. Here's a paradigm shift as well going on. Um, my friend Brian Ferguson, who studied war and anthropology, he, he really is the anthropologist of war, uh, calls it the war forever backwards view. And this war forever backwards implies that um, war just goes way back to the earliest human roots. In a relatively recent book on violence and warfare among hunter-gatherers, the editors of this volume, Allen and Jones, conclude hunter-gatherers, both simple and complex, engaged in socially sanctioned lethal conflict between independent polities, suggesting an extremely long history of warfare that can ultimately be traced back to early hominids. Or in other words, wars millions of years old, um, argue these anthropologists. However, archaeology does not support this conclusion. With one possible exception, the worldwide archaeological evidence for warfare is within about the last one, uh, excuse me, the last 10,000 years. So that's one point just to keep in mind. There's no archaeological evidence of war, warfare going forever backwards, as Ferguson says. But there's more to it than this. And then point number two is very often overlooked. The more to it is, we do see archaeological various regional sequences. For example, in the Pacific Northwest of North America, the Valley of Oaxaca and Mexico, or in the Near East, and various other places, that show transitions from conditions of warlessness into conditions of warfare within the last 10,000 year time span. So again, in yellow print for emphasis, in short, actual archeological evidence contradicts the assertions that war is ancient. Um, so let's uh, look in a little more detail at this book that I cited by Allen and Jones, an edited book. Um, and what I, the point I'm gonna make here is that they don't really have any evidentiary background for concluding that war would have gone back to the hominins millions of years back to where humans split off from other ape species. They just don't have the evidence, but that does not stop them from stating this and making that conclusion in their book. So let's talk about evidence. First of all, if you're gonna talk about older than um, 10,000 years ago or so, and you're gonna talk about war all the way back to when we split six million years ago or so from our nearest ape relatives, you need data on that time period. And I put in, in red print here, as you can see, any of the chapters that dealt with data that's older than 9,000 years ago. So we see chapters three, four, 10, and 11 having something to do with this. In the first chapter dealing with Europe, um, all we see here in the evidence that goes back to 12,000 years before present is um, Pleistocene to Holocene, only skeletal trauma. Skeletal trauma is not evidence of warfare. It might be warfare. It might be falling off a cliff. It might be falling out of a tree. It might be um, having a fight and having your arm broken. Uh, it's all sorts of things, but we can't conclude because there's some skeletal trauma that war was present. That's the main point in chapter three. Now, if we go on to chapter four, the uh, archeologists looked at all examples, all known examples of um, skeletons older than 9,000 years ago in North America. So quite a collection there. And the injuries were mostly non-lethal is what he concluded. Again, there's no evidence of war um, being real old here. In chapter 10, they say the record goes back to about 11,000 uh, years ago, BP is before present. The quote is no substantive evidence of large scale conflict until the last two millennia, till the last 2,000 years. So none of these cases provide any evidence that war would be going forever backward or being very old. And finally, we come to um, chapter 11. And here we have a good archeological record as old as 12,000 years ago. 
the comments, complexity and war by historical times. So there's an ethno historical description of the Spanish first arriving off the coast of Baja, California um, and encountering the natives who were living on the small island, Cedros, um, Isla Cedros. And the oldest villages here are only 1,600 years old BP, even though there's a good archeological record going back for 12,000 years ago. So the fact that they're, they're fighting, um, they're living in villages and there's some evidence of, of warfare stat strategy and tactics and so forth, that's all recent stuff. All the other chapters here that I'm not commented on, you can look at the time period, just skim the time periods, nothing going past beyond 10,000 years ago. So what we have is a very interesting situation that sometimes occurs in silence, in silence, sorry, occurs in science, where you have people drawing conclusions or making interpretations that supposedly have a basis in data, but in fact do not. And it's a bit ironic and I'm sure that these editors are not pleased with me in pointing this out, but it's a bit ironic that they reached this totally groundless conclusion, supposedly based on data in their own book that they've edited, and it's just not there. It's just plain not there. So the vast majority of the chapters in Allen and Jones are based on ethnographic and archeological data from what we call in anthropology, the Holocene, that is within the last 11,000 years. None of the chapters, none of the chapters show war older than 10,000 years ago before the present. Some do show local origins of war, ironically, uh, again recently, and the chapters do show a pattern of war being associated with social complexity and sometimes with ecological or, or environmental changes. So it's all very interesting that the chapters themselves in this book, for the most part, are very well done. Um, the conclusions are reasonable and so forth. I certainly don't criticize the entire set of chapters. I'm just criticizing the disconnect where Allen and Jones would appear to be stuck into the old way of looking at things, war forever backwards, war being ancient, war being really part of, of humanity um, due to our evolution and so forth. That's the old paradigm. And not understanding that the various chapters within the book would support a non-killing, non-violence paradigm instead. Here's an overall statement from a different archeologist, Jonathan Haas, um, that really sets the big picture, sort of paints it for us real clearly and succinctly. Jonathan Haas says, archeologically, there is negligible evidence for any kind of warfare anywhere in the world before about 10,000 years ago. It was only about 10,000 years ago when the niches of the world were filled in through gradual population growth and people had to develop new settlement and subsistence strategies to extract adequate resources from decreased territory. So there are reasons why war originates uh, in different places at different times. And Jonathan Haas is pointing out one of the factors. So to sum this up, it's not just a matter of lack of evidence and older prehistoric region. Um, origins of war are visible. Origins accompany other changes. In other words, what we're calling social complexity, either in a hunter-gatherer sense or in the introduction of agriculture. Um, with social complexity, you get people settling down and living in the same place, farming the field or, or fishing extensively if there's aquatic resources available. So their population goes up. And as their population goes up, they need to feed more people, so they, they fish more. Um, picture a salmon run, for instance, where it's not difficult to just go down there and pull salmon out of the river. Or the birth of agriculture is the other model. As I said, you're growing more, more food, feeding more people. You get village life, population increase. Interestingly, this is when social inequity comes in, where you get um, leaders and followers. You get people at the top of the hierarchy and people at the bottom. And basically at this point is, is where you have war coming in sooner or later along as part of this development of complexity, the complexity complex. So it's not a mystery as to when war came in. We don't have to just presume it went all the way back to when we split off from the ape relatives. This really makes no sense whatsoever. Data recovery can be consistent over time and can show war beginning from no war. That's what the sequences tend to show. So archaeology and the non-killing paradigm, in many early times and places, the absence of war is theoretically consistent with the absence of the preconditions for war. And that is Brian Ferguson, 
uh, arguing against war forever backwards. Here's another interesting development in archaeology. David Dye has published a very good book called War Past Peace Paths. He's an archaeologist. He's looked at the eastern part of North America and pointed out how war comes in relatively late um, and it's associated with these complexity changes that we've been talking about. In the uh, an ancient and enduring peace system, perhaps, Brian Ferguson has located an area of the um, Near East, known as the Southern Levant, where there is about 10,000 years, 10,000 years of no evidence whatsoever of warfare. And in fact, very little evidence of, of anything that could be termed a, a homicide as well. So these were an extremely peaceful people living across uh, 10 millennia from about 13,000 BC to until about 3000 BC, just totally lacking war. So that could be a great example of an archeological peace system. Uh, could it be that an archeology span of peace may be emerging as a new field? I hope so. Switching now to nomadic foragers, which I've, I've mentioned, one of the other arguments that the old uh, paradigm has put forth is that, well, nomadic foragers really did do a lot of killing and they were pretty violent. Uh, that's our lot. And there have been quite a bit of assumptions about this. So um, what I'm going to argue to the contrary is that nomadic foragers actually do fit a new non-killing paradigm. Uh, there, there are, and this is a bit of a contradiction, there are in some groups homicides. Uh, in some groups, there tend to be very, very few homicides. So there's some diversity in homicides, but there's no real strong evidence that nomadic foragers are inclined towards engaging in warfare. Nomadic forager bands are not warlike. The old paradigm asserts that they are warlike stem from the mere assumptions, sampling bias, and questionable chimpanzee analogies. Most lethal aggression uh, cases among nomadic foragers are homicides, a few other are feud, and the minority are war. And this conclusion that I just read is based fundamentally on some research that I did with Patrick Sudaberry, who uh, graduated with his PhD from Obo Academy University a few years ago. What Patrick Sudaberry and I did was we used a very systematic sample of 21 nomadic forager bands, and we looked at every single lethal event that was reported in the literature for these 21 nomadic forager societies. So we found that the, the mean number or the average was seven lethal events per society. However, the range from smallest to largest was huge. It was from zero in some cases, three cases in fact, to 69 in the most violent case, the Tiwi of Northern uh, Australia. Three societies had no lethal events to emphasize that. Um, one society, the Tiwi of Australia, was a way out outlier, as actually one of the reviewers for this uh, publication wrote. And I thought that was clever. That, that sums it up pretty well. An outlier is something that's way out there. When my hand is going off the screen. Um, and a way out outlier is way, way out there. The Tiwi provided 69 lethal events of the 148. And that's about 47% all just coming from this one society. So by contrast, the next highest society had 15 lethal events and the third highest had 10. If the Tiwi data are removed, as you sometimes do when you're playing with data, just to see what happens if you take away this way out outlier, the mean number of lethal events per society for the remaining 20 nomadic forger societies is nearly cut in half. That is down to 3.95. So um, the Tiwi are making a big difference. For the lethal events, in all 21 nomadic foragers, the majority of them involved just one killer and one victim. And that's in yellow here, that's not war. One person killing one person, that's not war. 23% and 22% respectively involved uh, more than one killer killing one victim or more than one killer killing more than one victim. And these are interesting. Um, data, I think. It's thus, 78% of the lethal events involved only one victim. And again, we can ask the question, hmm, is that really meeting our understanding of what war is? Here's another way of looking at the data, which is, uh, I think, telling. If you look at the cases where there's more than one perpetrator, 
or uh, more than one perpetrator, well, more than one perpetrator killing more than one victim, which might be war, right? That's, that's a group on group killing situation. Or more than one perpetrator killing only one victim. This is how it charts out. And notice that this didn't occur at all in about half of the societies. And it it's also highlights just how odd and different the Tiwi are. Look at the Tiwi lines in comparison to the other lines and the numbers. So Tiwi, something very interesting and odd is going on with them. Um, Patrick and I also looked at whether the reasons for the killing were interpersonal or intergroup. And if you look at the, the, the column that says um, all the other societies compared to the column that says the Tiwi only, you see a flip-flop in the pattern. So in other words, Tiwi only, 34, 35% um, interpersonal, but all the others, 63% um, were interpersonal conflicts. That is a lot of interpersonal conflicts. It again, is not leading us towards a conclusion that war is prevalent. It's leading us to the conclusion that when killings do occur, they tend to occur for interpersonal reasons. Intergroup, if you move down there to the next um, row that's in red, you see, like I say, it flip-flops. So uh, the Tiwi, much of their conflicts, the majority of them do involve intergroup and very uh, relatively smaller percent involve um, interpersonal conflicts. My conclusion is that neither the forger data nor the archeological evidence support the man, the warrior view. And Patrick and I, and Fry and Sotaberry, provide some data-based conclusions. So first of all, to highlight, one person killing one person is not war. And that, in fact, was the majority of the cases. Killing within the local group is not war. I say within the group, that's not warfare. That was another relatively large number of these, these um, killings. Interpersonal motivations, such as jealousy, do not reflect war. And as pointed out, most of these um, killings were due to interpersonal conflicts of some sort or another. Uh, except among the Tiwi, which is a bit odd. So um, within the group, uh, sorry, <laughs> the final point here, the fourth point, within group execution, starvation, cannibalism, and hunting accidents also occurred and they are not war. So the overall picture here is the nomadic foragers. If we're gonna use them as sort of a, a picture or an indication as to what humans lived like across millennia when we all lived as nomadic foragers, it does not support this old paradigm assumption, presumption that there was lots and lots of killing, and certainly not that there was lots of warfare. Um, to the contrary, it supports a new paradigm point of view. Well, let's continue with a few other forms of evidence, and then we'll wrap this up with some conclusions. So first of all, peaceful societies exist. These are societies that are non-warring. These are also societies that are internally peaceful. And, uh, I've generated a couple of lists of, of both types of these peaceful societies that have been published. There's a lot of other ethnography on this, including in one of the, the books called Non-Killing Societies, edited by Schwann Evans Pym. Some neighboring societies also exist as peace systems. And this means that they don't make war on each other, and sometimes not with outsiders at all. So peace systems are clusters of neighboring societies that don't make war with each other. And it might be that they do engage in warfare outside the peace system, or it could also be in other cases that they don't engage in war, period. There are both types of peace systems. So here are some examples of peace systems that have been documented in the historical and anthropological literature. Um, Upper Xingu River Basin in Brazil, an interesting case, totally different scale, the European Union, a great historical ethnographic example uh, the Iroquois, Aborigines of the Western Desert in Australia. These are all examples of clusters of neighboring societies that don't engage in war with each other. And they're representing different um, continents. Down towards the bottom of the list, notice that we include the Swiss cantons. You know, for about a thousand years, Swiss cantons did engage in, in periodic wars with each other. They formed alliances sometimes, the alliances shifted. They were neighboring social units that did engage with war, but then they came together and formed the, the country of Switzerland and gave this all up. So in that sense, they're a historical example of how previously existing neighbors who did engage in war then became a unified 
peace system that gave up war and in fact started considering themselves to be one people. The Nordic countries, again, an interesting uh, example of a peace system. Very few people know that the Nordic countries have not get engaged in any war amongst themselves for over 200 years, since 1815. That's just a quiet, humble, remarkable, nice experience, um, which is in contrast to uh, most parts of, of other parts of Europe. So again, this also illustrates the point that peace systems can and do engage in war outside the system. But the key concept is when you find a peace system is it's a cluster of neighboring societies that don't war with each other. So let's just turn to the European Union very briefly here as a wonderful example of a historically documented um, peace system. Um, and one thing I like about the European Union is that we have that history. We know how it came about. We know what the motivations were of, of, the, founder, of the founders of the European Union. And that motivation was they wanted to eliminate war on the continent. They wanted to eliminate war, and that was their major goal. Uh, peace building was the major goal. So what this involved, uh, in, in brief, is shifts in norms and values and behaviors, the creation of new institutions to create this peace system. And it's been highly effective in that regard. Of course, Europe has had its challenges, like any continent, uh, any region has. But war is no longer considered an option within the EU. Just like war amongst the five Nordic countries, some of which belong to the EU, but not all of them, it's just considered unthinkable. Norway is not going to attack Sweden or Iceland's not going to attack anybody. You know what I mean? So this is a huge change in orientation from when World War II ravaged Europe, uh, as we speak about the European Union context. So thinking about peace systems, um, our research team has generated a set of hypotheses. Some of these were already laid forth in an article uh, in 2012. Um, we've expanded them slightly after this. Overarching social identity is that you don't just perceive yourself as Finnish, for example, but now you perceive yourself also as Nordic. Uh, you don't just perceive yourself as French, now you also perceive yourself in a more overarching way. And the same holds for the Xingyu people um, or the Iroquois and so forth. Interconnections among the subgroups of different types, whether they be trade and economic connections or intermarriage. Interdependence, where uh, Monet and his founders of Europe created deliberately uh, economies that interlocked and were needed um, to, to interact and be dependent upon each other. Non-warring values and norms. We're going to highlight that shortly. But that's a very important part of, of peace systems. And there's symbolism, myths, legends, um, ceremonies, rituals that reinforce the norms and the values of peace, the non-warring norms and values, the non-killing wars and values. Superordinate institutions, conflict management mechanism, leader, uh, visionary leadership for peace, all of these things we're hypothesizing are part of peace systems. And what we've done very recently has done a study comparing peace systems with a, com a comparison group of non-peace systems. So what I'd like to do is show you a, a few slides from this article. Here's the, the name of the article, multiple authors, nine of us working together with Frank Suyak as lead authors. It's called Societies Within Peace Systems Avoid War and Build Positive Intergroup Relations. And uh, this came out, as you can see, just a couple of months ago in January 2021, um, here's the, the string of authors. Um, as I mentioned, we looked at peace systems. So I'm a little too far there. I'll just read a little bit from the abstract to give you an idea as to what we did. Um, a comparative anthropological perspective reveals not only that some human societies do not engage in war, but also that peace systems exist. Peace systems are defined as clusters of neighboring societies that do not make war on each other. The mere existence of peace systems is important because it demonstrates that creating peaceful intergroup relationships is possible, whether the social units or tribal societies, nations, or actors within a regional system. 
So let's get to the data. Now that I think you, you have a sense of the um, purpose and the idea. It's got pictures, which is a plus, but it's also got numbers. You don't need to be reading all of this. But you're welcome to go and read in more detail. So let's look at table two. And this gets to the, the heart of the matter. Here are some of the variables I showed you in a slide, the overarching identity, the interconnectedness, interdependence, non-warring values and norms, the non-warring myths, rituals, and symbols, subordinate institutions, conflict management, we lumped all types together, peace leadership. And then we also tossed in just a few war variables because that would be interesting as well to see what happens. Now here's the, the scale where a one code means none, it just doesn't exist. Two is a weak, three is moderate, and four is strong. So when you look at these numbers, the means here and the means in this column, and let me go back up one smidgen. There we go. So when we compare, this is your, your task that you take it on, compare the size of the numbers, the larger the numbers, the more it's leaning towards um, moderate or high, with the four being maximum, um, zero being, sorry, one being um, none or doesn't exist. Three is larger than two, three is larger than two and a half, three is larger than two and a third. Three and two thirds is larger than two, uh, 0.84, et cetera, et cetera. So here are the significant values. There are many, but not all, a couple would not come out significant. Many, but not all of the hypothesis um, came out as significantly different where the peace systems had more overarching identity, interdependence, stronger norms and values that supported non-killing, non-warring, uh, in other words, peace, than did a comparison group, the non-peace systems. And down here, it flip-flops, as you notice. These numbers as a group are larger than these. So in other words, among the non-peace systems, there tended to be more warring values and norms war myths, rituals, and symbols, and war leadership. These last three are significant, uh, so you can see that. So those are interesting contrasts. We were also able to do an analysis, thanks to a couple of our co-authors who are mathematical whizzes, um, where you look and you determine what variables are what they call most important. And this, has a, this analysis has a, a wonderful name called random forest importance score. And here the important thing is, the important thing about importance is just to notice the relative difference. Uh, it, it's just a score, it doesn't necessarily mean anything concrete. But what it is telling us is non-warring norms. Singly is the most important thing that differentiates a peace system from a non-peace system, which is pretty cool. Norms matter, rituals and values also high, they matter. And so the relative importance drops down, as you can see from the numbers here, where this one is you know, about, just very roughly speaking, about um, you know, one, what am I trying to say, one, one tenth or so, do the math. Um, so there are some that are more important than others. And the most important ones, again, are non-warring norms, non-warring rituals, non-warring values, security, interdependence, subordinate, su sorry, superordinate, cross-spanning institutions, economic interdependence. So if you want to focus on how peace systems are different, you especially want to be looking at some of this stuff and less so at some of this stuff. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. So as we continue our whirlwind tour and then wrap it up real quickly here, um, there's also military science, which is contributing to a new non-killing paradigm. Most men have inhibitions against killing. It must be overcome by military training, warrior values, cultural beliefs that support the killing. Um, men in battle, there's the uh, Gettysburg weapons example I'll, I'll show you on the, next, on the next screen. But we also have the interesting statistic that during World War II, the fighter pilots um, 
Less than 1% of the pilots shot down 30 to 40% of the Axis aircraft. So there's some sort of interesting restraint going on there. These guys are basically up flying around. They're not shooting down enemy in any great numbers. And this type of restraint is also illustrated by a historian, um, General Marshall, who looked, he did a series of interviews with World War II combat troops, combat troops, the ones that were actually fighting. And he discovered that most troops were not aiming their guns and at an enemy soldier and trying to kill that soldier. They were shooting their weapons up in the air. They were shooting their weapons into bushes. They weren't shooting their weapons at all. Um, so there's a restraint uh, against shooting your weapons and trying to actually kill somebody on the other side. Uh, finally, I'll just draw attention to the high rates of PTSD reported across a variety of different wars um, and the high suicide of U.S. veterans. There's this horrible statistic that more veterans have died by committing suicide after being engaged in combat um, than actually died in combat. And that should give us pause to think about um, non-killing as a new paradigm to replace the idea that humans somehow are just inclined towards war, love war, eager to kill, um, readily kill on the battlefield and so on and so forth. Yes, there's an occasional soldier who is that way, but for the most part, the typical human male, and the, most of the, the combat soldiers are male, must be really trained and programmed to be able to do this and often suffer serious psychological effects. So here's a, a study, uh, the results of this are reported in War, Peace and Human Nature and other sources, um, but someone collected all of the muskets from the Gettysburg battlefield. And in total, there were 17,500 some muskets and 90, percent of them, 90 percent were loaded. And this didn't make any sense at first. If soldiers were in that day, they had to load the musket, push down a rod, you know, this type of thing. Uh, you'd expect about 5 percent of the muskets that could be picked up from the battlefield to actually um, be loaded. So what was going on? Something was certainly going on. 44 percent of these muskets were loaded more than once and 6,000 out of the 27,000 muskets were loaded between three and 10 times, and some even more than that. So clearly this idea that humans on the battlefield in the midst of battle are loading their guns and shooting and loading their guns and shooting uh, is not supported by this evidence. What you can figure is happening is somebody's got their heads down and they're loading their musket and they're loading their musket and they're loading their musket, and they're never going to shoot that musket. Um, so, interesting view. Let's consider homicide for a minute, because this is another important element to think about in terms of a killing paradigm versus a non-killing paradigm. Homicide rates are variable. That's first very important. Culture and other factors do affect rates of homicide. But here's some rates for contemplation. If you look at some of the most peaceful societies known in anthropology, including the Japanese as a nation, um, you get one or two uh, killings per 100,000. That text in my Japanese, that's pretty low, pretty low rate, one or two per 100,000. Um, other societies, for instance, uh, Finland has about five per 100,000. Oops, we're missing a zero there, but uh, use your imagination, five per 100,000. And some researchers did a very interesting thing. They attempted to calculate the homicide rate during World War II in Europe, which would include all the civilian homicides, as well as all war-related deaths, and just look at it that way. And even when you take into account um, all of World War II going on in Europe, it was still merely, I say merely, slightly in quotes, but you know, between 450 and 600 deaths per 100,000. So, um, that's something to think about as well. And then the other thing that these researchers did, which was interesting, was they tried to estimate for Homo sapiens, for the entire species, what is the homicide rate? They come up with about 7.6 per 100,000 around the world, all this variation taken into account. That's well below, I might add as a, as a comment, that's well below the 2% average for primates that we started with. So non-killing, um, Paradigm, conflict resolution, this is really the last point before we get to the conclusions. There are many, many different ways that humans deal with conflict. Some of the approaches do involve violence, 
but many of them do not. And sociologist Daniel, Donald Black has helped us to um, think about this by identifying five major approaches that humans use to manage their conflicts. First of all, many times we just avoid the person with whom we have a conflict, and that certainly doesn't lead to aggression. And other times we tolerate the situation. Eh, what the, just go on your way, put up with the relationship, but um, don't, don't make a fuss over it. That's toleration. And of course, many, many times, every day, we're negotiating little things and bigger things in our lives with other people. And that's not usually involving any aggression whatsoever. It involves compromise and creative problem solving, um, tit for tat solutions, and all sorts of other things to work it out, find a solution that's agreeable to both sides. That's negotiation, again, without violence. But here enters the possibility for violence when you have coercion, also called self redress. Um, combativeness as a style is sometimes used. You might threat or intimidate, bully. You might punch or hit or even kill. Um, so this is an option among humans. We're not totally nonviolent. But again, I just want to emphasize as we're thinking about a nonviolent paradigm, we have culture that is so important to us. And there are cultures, the Samang, the Japanese, the Batek, the Ifaluk, many, many cultures that are very, very peaceful. And we can create cultures of peace and cultures of non-killing, which the level of, of homicides would actually go down to nil. That's the human flexibility. That's the human dependence on, on culture. And of course, we can, commute those, we can um, create those peace systems, which no longer rely on war as they interact with other members of the system. And so what's going to keep us from preventing, sorry, total, total misstatement, what's going to prevent us from creating a global peace system? where war is simply banished from the planet altogether. Again, culture is important. And we saw from our study on peace system that creating those norms and values that promote peaceful solutions to conflict as opposed to war-laden ones are possible. It's possible because it's been done. So uh, conflict resolution is yet another area that humans engage in cross-culturally. We do a lot of that. Uh, most of the options are nonviolent. So to recap, what we've looked at um, here is just a whole variety of different fields and subfields uh, within anthropology and beyond to consider the different lines of evidence, as I said at the beginning, that are all pointing or going in the same direction and, and suggesting that there really is a strong non-killing, non-violent tendency in humans, in our, in our natures, in our societies. And it just makes sense in evolutionary terms. And this is supported by archaeology and nomadic forager studies and the fact that there are peaceful societies, the fact that we do develop peace systems, that we have that capacity. But if you look at our species overall, our homicide rate is not huge, contrary to some of the Hollywood myths that are portrayed, perpetrated on us. Um, humans do deal with conflicts in many ways. So what are some of the implications or the contrast between an old paradigm and a new paradigm? Um, in the old paradigm, killing is sometimes acceptable, but in a new paradigm of non-killing, killing is not acceptable. Belief systems that are supportive of violence and killing, but we could also have a belief system that is supportive of non-violence and non-killing. Peace systems certainly show non um, uh, peaceful societies certainly show this this potential. Core values are again important to think about. With the old paradigm, dominance prevails, Materi materialism, power, profit. Um, the last two are sometimes called, you know, the two Ps of power and profit. Uh, this is an old paradigm view. We could, with a new non-killing paradigm, focus more on relationship, respect, reciprocity, and redistribution, these four R's instead of um, more dominating violent uh, values. Finally, um, Dominance has been emphasized, and Rianne Eisler, who's written a lot on the domination model, has pointed this out to us, that much of our societies today are focused on dominance, but this is not inevitable. We could switch towards equity, just like the capuchin monkeys uh, are striving for. That's um, what Eisler calls the partnership model. Competition is emphasized among the old paradigm. Um, remember nature? red and tooth and claw uh, and other elements of competition. But in the new paradigm, 
we can also acknowledge that cooperation is really important and that we humans cooperate um, very easily and well. Negative peace in the old paradigm, uh, peace is merely the absence of war, but in a new paradigm, we can explore in addition to negative peace, all sorts of elements of positive peace. In the old paradigm, think about all the militarism, the military budgets, uh, the building of the weapons, the arms trade, the actual engaging in warfare, the fact that there are nuclear weapons imperiling all of humanity as we speak on this planet, that could be replaced in a new paradigm with really an emphasis on human security with the human in all caps. How can you provide for well-being, safety and security for humans? How can you make sure that they have safe water to drink, that they have health care, roofs over their heads, decent employment, ability to participate in the political system, et cetera, et cetera. All sorts of elements of, of human security um, could be implemented in a new paradigm instead of uh, a military security. Okay, old paradigm, coercive, unilateral, reactive, new paradigm focuses on CR and CM, conflict resolution, conflict management, a collaborative approach, a cooperative approach, preventive approach to, to disputes and so on and so forth. Peace systems tend to do this. In the old paradigm, fear-based and fear-promoting in a new paradigm, trust-based and pro-social promoting. Finally, unsustainable research, the resource use into this old way or the way we're doing things most of the time nowadays, that certainly has to change if we're going to survive on this planet towards a sustainable use of resources, which is part, again, of human well-being and human security. So these would be the overall contrasts as I see it between the existing or old paradigm and the new paradigm, and the fact that we even have a new paradigm and a lot of evidence to support this new interpretation that favors non-killing and non-violence uh, as, as human and social characteristics is a positive message. So let's return to the challenges. How can we support cultural change away from violence and war towards non-killing and non-violence? How can we support the new paradigm as an alternative to the old paradigm? Or how can we help to redefine the default assumptions to promote human well-being and survival, a positive and a negative piece? Thank you very much.